Okay, so you're building your PC, you're about to put on the stock cooler, and you realize, drat, I've used this one before, and lo and behold, the stock thermal paste is no longer there. You go over to wherever you keep your supplies of thermal paste, you open up the drawer, you check them, and they're all empty. But here's the thing, you're only using this PC for gaming, you're not overclocking, and how important is that grey goop anyway? Can you game without it? And if not, how expensive a film paste do you really need? Well, today we're sure as hell gonna find out. Okay, so testing methodology for today is we've got an ASUS H87i Plus motherboard with my gently used i5 4690, a pretty average CPU in terms of how much heat it produces and the kind of performance you can get out of it. Yeah, it's not the most modern thing in the world, but we need something that produces a realistic amount of heat. On top of that during testing was this, the Cryorig C7, because it's the closest thing that I've got really to an Intel stock cooler that will fit an Intel CPU, because of course I don't have an Intel stock cooler, so that's what was used for testing, because obviously we want something that is well, realistic to what you might have in your situation. After all, you're emulating one of these. But of course, not something so big like a Hyper 212 Evo that it will just not make a difference anyway. Finally, throw in my well, pretty damn nice GTX 1080, 16 gigs of HyperX Savage DDR4, DDR4, DDR3 memory, and a whopping 1600 megahertz. It does actually go up to 1866. But due to limitations on, well, H boards, it's only clocked at 1600 with really tight timings instead. All in all, I tested seven different thermal interface materials, including six pastes, all the way down from the lowly, what's it called? Heinze? Yeah, Heinze 1.93 watt meter Kelvin, really cheap, nasty stuff, all the way up, all the way up to, of course, our one liquid metal, my favorite, Conductor North, as well as, of course, a baseline done without any thermal paste at all to see if well, it really can get by without it, or a thermal paste really is needed that badly. Also, a quick disclaimer, please, for the love of God, even if you can get away without thermal paste, put thermal paste on your CPU for crying out loud. Like, granted, something like this, or like this, or like either of these, might be able to cool it without thermal paste, but the chances are you are more than likely degrading your CPU by doing that, so seriously, put on some thermal paste, it will if not be amazing, because you've got the cheapest stuff possible, it will still prolong the life of your CPU considerably. Okay, so what was used for testing was my usual suite. Starting off then with, of course, OCCT burn-in test, Cinebench R15 to make sure that they are running, well, the CPU is running as fast as it should be, Tomb Raider, Dirt Rally, War Thunder, and of course, Time Spike and Fire Strike to give a good variety of results so we can see how it actually performs under different circumstances. Also, a quick thing, the reason why we are using, well, deltas here rather than just show, well, me pointing out the scores one by one, is that really the deltas are showing more of a story. If there was a delta of almost nothing, then that of course shows that, well, realistically, it doesn't make a huge difference. But if there is a delta of 50, 100, 200, 500 on a given test, then that obviously shows that something here is definitely making a fairly huge difference. And keep in mind, some of these deltas even on thermal paste, are absolutely minute, like in some cases less than a couple of points. Hence the reason why I'm doing it by deltas, because that really gives you more of a representation of the difference, performance-wise, test to test. Okay, starting off then, on the OCCT burning test, well, the only real takeaway is that anything is better than nothing. But on a heat load of 100-ish watts on a stock or small form factor cooler, the difference in thermal paces really do not account for much at all, and um, as in the following tests will show, the differences are negligible or within margin of error, although no pace did not finish the test as it just straight up crashed to desktop. On Firestrike, across the board, all tests were, well, within margin of error, with a delta on total score of less than 100 points total, and 116 for the physics portion, aka the CPU portion. A minute performance difference in line with, well, test-to-test -test variants. Time Spy told a similar, if not identical, story, with a performance delta of 58 points on the physics portion, and in total the score was a delta, again, of a mere 40 or so points, well within margin of error. 
Finally, for the standardised benchmarks, the Cinebench R15 told again our favourite story of almost no difference CPU test to CPU test, with a 7 FPS delta on the OpenGL test, an 11 point delta on the multi-core test, and a mere 3 point delta on the single core test, all of which well, are within what might be considered a margin of error at best for this type of test. Moving on to the 1080p benchmarks, and we see an all too familiar story, but with some interesting things to take home. In Tomb Raider, we had a minimum FPS delta of 6 FPS, a maximum FPS delta of 12 FPS, and on average, we had a delta of less than 5 FPS, showing some honestly incredible consistency test to test. But where it gets interesting is where you look at the thermal deltas. Now, I don't have averages for thermals in my games, but I do have the minimums and the maximums reported temps on any given core, as you will see on this graph here, and WOW! Thermal pace makes a difference, who would have thought? What you can see, there is definitely a definite noticeable difference in-game thermally. Okay, for no thermal pace, the temps are 70, well, 73 to 85 degrees Celsius, which is way too hot for a quad-core, but even with our cheapest pace, the max attempts dropped by almost 30 degrees Celsius. And with Conductor Nought, our max dropped all the way down to, well, 51 to 52 degrees C. Not so far from 35 degrees C drop. That's huge. Our minimum temps also saw a very healthy drop from 73 degrees C to 41 on Conductor Nought. And now, although we saw a very definite drop in thermals, we saw almost zero difference in FPS across all pastes and without. Moving on to Dirt Rally N, well let's start off with our FPS results and deltas. And in minimums we saw a mere 5 FPS delta in the mid 90s. In maximums we saw a, ma a far larger 17 FPS delta. That is due to one anomaly on the Arctic MX4 results. If you take that anomaly out, the data then shrinks to a mere 3 FPS delta. And on averages, the anomaly again makes the delta larger to 10 FPS, but if you exclude it, there is only a 5 FPS difference, test to test, if you exclude the MX4 fluke. Firmly, things again are pretty interesting. Overall, the test ran a fair bit hotter than our previous tests, but not by much. Although, interestingly, our no pace run dropped by a few degrees. Now, our max temp on zero pace was 82 degrees C, and its minimum was 73 degrees C. Moving over onto the Heinze, or... They need a better name, seriously, that is... It's just so hard to go ahead and read. And well, some pace is better than nothing. Dropping the temps from, well, like I said, 82 and 73 to 59C max and 47C minimum. With the go-to favourite conductor knot, the temps further dropped from 50 degree, 53 degrees C and 44 degrees C minimum. Finally, the last game tested was, of course, War Thunder and its Pacific War Day benchmark. With the FPS stats then, on our minimums we saw a mere 12 FPS delta. As we don't have maximums for this one, we're just going to jump straight to the averages. And well, we only saw a 9 FPS delta. Considering that this is over 400 FPS, 9 FPS ain't going to make a difference at all. On the thermal side, however, again, the no pace run dropped some degrees over the previous test, dropping to 72 degrees C maximum and 65 degrees C minimum. Our pace El Cheapo brought these temps well, well under control to 52 degrees C maximum and only 47 minimum. But with liquid metal, we brought it even further down to 50 degrees C maximum and a practically chilly 41 degrees C minimum. So, what have we learned today? Well, you can in fact game on a well, pretty tiny cooler with a mid-range CPU, and um, also learned that the CryoRig C7 is shockingly good at cooling the i5-4690 when gaming. And finally, we also learned that any pace at all will always make an absolutely huge difference to, well, your thermals in-game, at idle, but stress testing, anything. Any pace makes a huge difference over no paste. Should you run without thermal paste? Hell no! Like I said, you can run a CPU without thermal paste moderately well as long as you're not overclocking and generally speaking, your day-to-day -day usage, you won't notice much of a difference. However though, 
All these, they work a lot better with any film or pace whatsoever. Even ones where the cold plate or, in the case of the, well, kind of pretty damn nice, Hyper 212 Evo copper heat pipes, any film or paste will make a huge difference. And more than that, if you don't use film or paste, you're generally going to be running that CPU 20, 30, 40 degrees hotter than it actually needs to be. And because of that, you're going to be running it in the mid 80s and plus. You know, which is generally speaking the sort of area where your CPU is going to start suffering long-term damage due to the fact that it's running so hot all the time. Granted, you won't see that damage immediately. It might take six months. It might take six years. But either way, you are degrading the CPU's you know, lifespan quite considerably if you're running it hotter than it actually needs to be. So you can run it without thermal paste, but the only time that you should be running it without thermal paste is when you are waiting for more thermal paste to turn up because you really do need to get up and running that soon. This doesn't mean, oh, all right, I'll just put this on here and I will forget about it forever until I build the next system because you didn't put any thermal paste on. What it means is, sure, put it on, use the PC for a couple of days whilst you're waiting for your thermal paste to turn up. Then when it does turn up, put thermal paste on. That is the only situation where you should be running without thermal paste. So to reiterate, any pace is better than no pace. And finally, whilst we didn't see a huge difference between all of our tests here, there is a huge difference between all these thermal pastes when you are using a high-end air cooler and of course a high-end CPU and you're overclocking. That's generally speaking the kind of situation where, you know, these two here, Cryonaut and of course my favorite Conductonaut, you don't just use these on a CPU to keep it cool, you use these on a CPU to overclock. Or if you've got a really bad cooling situation, in which case conductor naught might actually help and make a difference. But generally speaking, you're not buying pastes like these just to go ahead and play a game. You're buying them because you're overclocking and therefore you're putting out a lot more heat than most use cases. So to reiterate, any paste is better than no paste. And high-end thermal paste with a high-end cooler is great for overclocking. Otherwise, you are fine with the stock cooler and even the most basic thermal paste. But yeah, you can get by on a Cryorig C7, even without thermal paste, but seriously, don't. Just don't. So, that all said, I'm going to go ahead and call it here. So, anyway, like the video if you like it, dislike it if you dislike it. Any thoughts or questions, leave them in the form of comments down below. Links to everything that was featured today in the description below, along with the links to my Facebook, Patreon, and Twitch pages. Also, hit that notification bell, at, well, that subscribe button and the notification bell for more content from me, The 117th Con. And as always, this is The 117th Con, signing off. Stay safe out there, folks, and I will catch you all in the next one.